the, the approaches is what we want to uh, uh, talk about. And, and so I think, Keith, you, you, um, you're now going to lead us into a session with uh, Stefan as well about um, uh, trials for the leukodystrophies emerging across the world. And I think it ties in nicely with the whole question of how we collect data and uh, how we enable trials. Yeah, so uh, S Stefan and I will cover some of the past and present leukodystrophy trials. Um, and you can pull up some of those slides if you want. Let's see, do I have a clicker or do I? Here we go. Okay, um, so I'll do an overview of leukodystrophy trials, uh, basically drawn from clinicaltrials.gov. Um, so for, those, for the uninitiated, clinicaltrials.gov is a good home base for looking for clinical trials that are active uh, or going to be coming online that may be specific to your disease. It works just a simple search term here, and you can narrow using a whole bunch of different categories here. Uh, but for your specific leukodystrophy, or uh, maybe if you're looking for if a, if a drug is being used in any other condition, you can really search those terms here. In the U.S., it's uh, required for most clinical trials to be registered on this uh, site, so it is a it is a good clearinghouse. As of 2000, it was created, and uh, more recently, it's become a requirement. Um, so, uh, in in Europe and other countries, they've begun using this as well uh, because it does provide it a useful database. Uh, not every non-American trial is going to be here, but uh, there's a, a good number of them. So. Um, this is the website. It's just clinicaltrials.gov, okay? Um, and so this is uh, a, just an, a, an overview of how many clinical trials uh, have been kind of designated for patients with leukodystrophies uh, since 2000, as of, you know, yesterday, uh, October 1st was the update. And um, so we've had a total of 61 trials. Now, this includes uh, natural history studies, and um, also many observational studies, and that's actually the majority of what's been done. Um, but there are a few interventional trials, and I'll touch base on a couple of them. Uh, but you'll notice that um, many of the studies have been done in countries, or at least registered, outside of the U.S., right? I mean, we have several in Asia, uh, uh, South America, and of course, many in Europe. Um, this is not a complete representation, representation of trials out, outside the U.S., but it's a start. Um, and then if we look at just trials that are now actively recruiting in the U.S., you know, we're down to 18, which is not, not bad. Uh, I will say that uh, we'll, 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 um, we'll point out that uh, the U.S. and Europe have the most trials registered here, and I think that's also true to say that they have the most trials running. Uh, but I'll mention a, uh, uh, one or two studies outside of these areas as well. Um, we have uh, in the U.S., this is how the breakdown currently looks of those that are registered and actively recruiting at this moment. Um, and uh, Minnesota, where Troy is leading the charge, and uh, actually many of these are actually run out of Troy's institution at the University of Minnesota. Um, so they, they've been uh, the leaders, uh, one of the leaders in the tran uh, bone marrow transplant movement and leukodystrophies for, well, since the origin. Uh, and um, but uh, several other trials running around the country. I will say what's not included in this um, in this graphic are studies that are ongoing but not recruiting, and that that includes the um, uh, the Bluebird gene therapy trial, which is um, the current phase is not recruiting at this time, but is ongoing. Okay. This is a breakdown of the U.S. Uh, uh, these are the ten U.S. Uh, studies that are ongoing at the moment. And most of these, I think at least half, are um, diagnostic or observational. Okay, we, all, we have really a couple that are interventional. Most of them are um, bone marrow transplant. There's one that's looking at uh, oligodendrocyte-like uh, cells uh, that they're doing along with bone marrow transplant. And, um, you know, and a select number of others. So it's uh, I, the part of the perspective I want to convey here is that um, I, I, what I, one of my intentions is in a couple of years to look back at this and compare it to where where we are now to where we are in a few years, and I think we'll be all be uh, 
my prediction is we'll all be pleasantly surprised at with the progress we've made. Um, in Europe, we have, uh, I'm going to let uh, uh, Stefan uh, delve into the details here, but these are the seven actively recruiting trials in Europe. Um, we have uh, several in Germany, uh, France, Denmark, so on. Um, and uh, this is the uh, list of trials in Europe, the 11 trials in Europe. And we have also, uh, you know what, I think this is a mistaken slide. It might be, uh, this might be actually the US trials. I, my apologies for jumping in. But I do have a few other trials that I wanted to point out that are interventional trials um, that are coming out of Europe. And uh, this is one that's being run in France, intracerebral gene uh, therapy for MLD. Uh, <clears throat> And this is, uh, they're doing a combined phase one, phase two. It's uh, open label. And um, I think uh, we will, uh, uh, it's been going on uh, for a, a relatively recent uh, period, but we'll be following up on this in the future. Uh, another uh, stem cell gene therapy for MLD and ALD. This is being run out of China. Um, and it says it's sponsored specifically by the uh, Shenzhen University Hospital um, using uh, uh, metapoietic stem cells. And uh, this is um, the oligodendrocyte derived uh, study being run out of Duke at the moment uh, for uh, various leukodystrophies. Um, I'm also going to just mention that we'll be uh, at Stanford will be opening up uh, and Minnesota will be opening up a trial for it's uh, uh, the only interventional leukodystrophy trial that I know of in the in the coming months. But this is a trial of vitamin D in boys without cerebral ALD between the ages of three and ten. Um, the background is just that we uh, we have some data that suggests that vitamin D may be helpful in reducing the risk of brain inflammation. We're looking for boys between ages three and ten uh, for enrollment who have a normal brain MRI and a diagnosis of ALD. Uh, we'll be prescribing a, a regimen of vitamin D for at least one year. Um, patients uh, ought to be seen at the University at Stanford or at the University of Minnesota every six months. So it'll be basically dose escalation from 2,000 to 4,000 with data analysis, uh, hopefully soon thereafter with uh, enlargement to uh, more U.S. and European sites. Um, it's, it's mostly a safety and biomarker trial. We'll be looking at a number of uh, measures to make sure that the patients don't develop vitamin D toxicity, looking at a few uh, biomarker measures. Um, change in, uh, you know, development of brain inflammation is a, is a secondary outcome measure. Um, so these are the current ALD Connect uh, uh, sites that we have here. Um, we'll have a couple open at the beginning. And um, I'm going to let uh, Stefan answer a few questions or uh, address a few uh, trials, and then he and I are going to try and field some questions at the end. So we wanted to leave more time for questions than really delving into uh, too much about the uh, trials at the moment. I will only focus on the trials that were... Sorry. I mean, <laughs> the trials that were done in Amsterdam. Uh, Oh, yeah. The trials that were done in Amsterdam, uh, all of these trials have been published, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it. Uh, um, so two slides per trial. Um, this is actually work that's all been done by Mark Engelen, uh, who was a PhD student in my in my group, but he's now uh, the, the pediatric neurology at the, uh, neurologist at the AMC. Um, and I'll, on the last slide, I will show you what uh, what he's doing currently. Uh, the first trial that we did was a lower statin trial. Uh, in 1998, in the, uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine, it was published that lower statin, a cholesterol-lowering cholesterol agent, would be effective for LD. Um, at that time, I was, work I was still working at Kennedy Krieger, and we, when we saw this paper, uh, we said, oops, this, is, this should not have been published. Uh, the problem is that it was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. So um, I think that if you're a local doctor and you're really up to the lit really up to or you know everything about the literature and certain disease, the journal you read is the New England Journal of Medicine. And if the, if this authoritative journal says that this is a treatment, then the the, the chance is uh, very high that patients will start using this. Uh, but we were not very happy with this study, and I will explain you why because. Um, 
what what it is a table out of the out of this this paper and it uh, there there are seven patients enrolled four males uh, and this is the uh, the value that's been reported before treatment and the problem is is that is it's the total uh, concentration of very long chain fatty acids and that's actually where the problem is because I was sh um, uh, the the problem is is that if you, if you add up, if you sum all the fatty acids, so the, 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 the total of C22 plus C24 plus C26, you need to acknowledge this, that there's a, this is very dangerous because this, the C26 is, is the, the, the fatty acid that we're interested in. But the ratio of C24 to C20, uh, C22, C24, C26 is 100 to 100 to 1. So if there would be an effect on C22, you would see a reduction, but it doesn't tell you anything about the effect of C24, of C26. Um, so there was a reduction in 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 the the total pool of plasma variant chain fatty acids. Um, and uh, what is interesting, uh, this is a cholesterol lowering uh, agent. Uh, it was accompanied by a lowering in cholesterol. Uh, but you also have to realize that these fatty acids that are sitting in plasma there, they're not sitting there by themselves, but most of them are esterified to cholesterol. So if you, if you lower the amount of cholesterol in plasma, we anticipated that, well, you take the fatty acids uh, along with them, but where do they go? Uh, so uh, when I got my PhD, uh, I was asked this question uh, in front of a large audience, and I said, one day, one day we will, we will do a uh, a proper uh, trial, a, ple a placebo-controlled trial, to to to, sh to find out if this is true or if this is not true. Well, it took us almost 10 years to do that trial. Uh, when we did it, we um, we did a, place a randomized uh, placebo-controlled trial. Uh, it was it was registered at uh, clinicaltrials.gov. And uh, what we showed is that uh, lower statin does lead to a small decrease in C24 and C26 in plasma. So that's true. However, when we isolated a lipoprotein and we measured specifically the C26 in li uh, lipoprotein particles, there was no change. Furthermore, when we looked in blood, in blood cells, there was no change. So, yes, it was true that well, our hypothesis from 10 years before that time is that, yes, uh, it's, it's very much likely due to the fact that you lower your cholesterol and hence you uh, lower the amount of binding, uh, uh, to, uh, binding uh, capacity of C26. Um, so, low statin should not be prescribed to, uh, to ALD patients. The second trial we did was with beta fibrate. Uh, and only one slide into the reason why we did beta fibrate. Um, we, we identified elongase 1 or elevio 1 as, as a therapeutic target because this is the key enzyme in, in making these C20, C, uh, very long chain fatty acids. And uh, we've been looking for, for compounds that could affect elevio 1. And uh, w one way or another, we stumbled upon beta fibrates. And here we, I show you the de novo synthesis of C26 out of C16. In, con in ALD fibroblasts, in the blue one are the untreated ALD fibroblasts, and this is with the increased dosage of beta fibrate, and this is the normal level. So if you see with 400 micromole of beta fibrate, you get a total normalization of uh, of synthesis of, of C26. We also found a reduction in plasma or in fibroblasts from patients uh, in C26. Um, we set up an enzyme assay. And we directly demonstrated that it's the CoA ester of beta fibrate that inhibits the enzymatic activity of ELV1. Uh, we did mouse studies, but uh, the mouse studies were unrevealing. Uh, later on, we found out that if you want to do fibrate studies in, in an ALD model, you should not take a, uh, a mouse, but you should ta take a guinea pig. Well, we don't have guinea pig models for ALD. So, and then we figured, well, beta fibrate has been used in the clinic for more than t 30 years, so we might as well go directly to patients. So that's what we did in a trial that was sponsored by the Stop ALD Foundation. We did a dose escalation study with beta fibrate. Um, and we want to do this very fast, because we've been talking about these, these preclinical pre studies uh, at meetings, at ULEF meeting and other meetings, and, and we were approached by patients who said, oh, yeah, I live in the US, I cannot get piece of fiber, but if I go across the border to Canada, I can buy it. So should I start doing it? We said, no, please don't do that. 
uh, we will start a clinical trial and we will I will promise you that we will publish the results within a year. And actually, that's what I did. Uh, th this should be 2012. But we started the, uh, the study in 2012, and we published the study in 2012 um, in an open access journal, so everybody could read about it. Uh, it was a dose escalation study. What we did, we, uh, it was a biochemical trial. Uh, patients were treated with 400 and 800 milligram of beta fibrate. We, uh, we collected blood cells and we just basically measured virulent chain for the acids in plasma and in blood cells. And, uh, and Moser measured for us the C26 lysa BCs in blood spots. Uh, untreated or baseline patients, uh, these are the levels in green. This is after 12 and after 24 weeks of treatment and these are the controls and you can see immediately that Beta fibrate was ineffective uh, uh, to do show any result on uh, on biochemistry, and um, the reason we think that beta fibrate was ineffective is that for the cells we needed 400 micromolar, and the, the, the highest levels of beta fibrate we could measure in plasma, right after taking the drug, was 25 micromolar. So simply, the simplest hypothesis is that the drug is not is, is uh, the clearance of the drug is too fast and we simply do not get high enough levels of beta fibrate in patients. So since then, we are looking for other compounds that can, can do the same, because what is clearly demonstrated that ELOV-01 is still one of our very good uh, therapeutic targets, uh, because inhibition directly affects uh, the levels of C26. The third trial we did uh, was an, uh, a cross-sectional cohort study with, for women with ALD, because for many, many years, uh, it has been was singing around that that uh, p p well uh, women with ALD they would not develop uh, symptoms, but if you just go to meetings, you see that that is not true. Uh, but the question is, what is the percentage of women with ALD that develop symptoms, and what are the symptoms? Are these same symptoms as m as men with AMN develop, or are they totally different symptoms? So we um, at the AMC we we most families with ALD are known to us at the AMC. Uh, so Mark, Mark he, uh, he recruited uh, all the females that he was seeing and he just simply asked them, well, ask your, 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 your sisters, your daughters, your, 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 anybody in the family uh, who is likely to have ALD. So uh, this was more or less a random selection because we, we, we did not look at, uh, at all the other participants that were involved. Um, so we did a study with 46 uh, carriers. Uh, we started the study, I actually I do not recall when we started the study because it took us three years to do the study, but let's guess it was somewhere between 2012, 2013. Um, and, and these got a whole battery of, 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 of tests that were done. Uh, we also did biochemistry, we did X inactivation. Uh, and uh, so the results I will show you on the next slide, but the, the good thing is that these, these, these women with ALD they are still uh, being seen every year at the AMC. So we figured, well, it's next year will be a good moment to do a follow-up study after five years. So we get uh, some kind of a natural history study uh, for the women with ALD. Um, and the results are is that, uh, well, this is a, a, a big table. It, it's, you, can, you can download it or you can email me and I can send you the paper. Uh, it's been published in Brain. Um, the conclusion, the bottom line conclusion is that women with ALD develop AMN and there is a sharp increase with age. Uh, at the, around the age of, of, of 60 years, 90% uh, of women with ALD develop symptoms, uh, AMN-like symptoms. Um, we did not see, a, uh, well, in the, in the cells that we used were blood cells and fibroids, we did not see a cor correlation with, uh, with X inactivation, but that's, that's still inconclusive because um, fibroblasts are probably not the, the right cells to look at for that study. Um, and then the, the, the last slide is the natural history study of ALD. Uh, we, we, uh, we, we, yeah, well, we realized that we had a large, nice cohort and since, since a year we, we call it the Dutch co ALD cohort. It's a prospective cohort. Um, it started last year uh, it, it includes, at the moment, 118 ALD patients, uh, and it's still increasing. We, even though we are a small country, we still find new families. Um, and it, it's amazing. Um, and what is important in, in this is that uh, Mark told me that 
uh, it's now more and more is that the index patients are the females. So all males are being, s well, we know most males uh, with ALD, but uh, apparently there are still a lot of females out there. Uh, maybe they're the only one in the family or, or, or simply because of chance there are no boys with ALD in that family. And uh, th th eventually they end up in, in, the, uh, in the institute and it turns out that they have ALD. Uh, so currently we have uh, 59 males of which 15 are uh, under the age of 18 years. We have 49, uh, 59 females. Uh, the clinical follow-up for the boys will be uh, every, is, is every six months, and for those uh, older than 12 years, it, it's once a year. The males get uh, all kinds of MRI uh, procedures. There's a small stu a pilot study with a seven Tesla MRI uh, being started. Uh, Mark also uh, is, is trying to get funding for, for an uh, OCT, uh, analysis. He has done uh, a pilot study now uh, with uh, baseline for 17 patients. Um, we have an extensive biobanking protocol, um, and this has all been done in, in, in one of the, the, the standard uh, clinical chemistry lab where everything is, is isolated from plasma to peripheral blood uh, cells, areas, uh, blood spots. I want blood spots. Uh, we will uh, isolate exosomes, uh, DNA, RNA, and cerebral spinal fluid from some of the mills who are willing to do that every year. Um, and uh, Mark, uh, he, ge he generated a, a database in Open Clinica. And uh, when I was at the biomarker uh, meeting in March, uh, I talked to Alex and, and some of the other ones, and I said, Mark, you have to talk to, talk to, the, to, to the guys from AOD Connect because we need to make sure that what we are collecting is more or less the same that here's been collected. And since, uh, well, the, 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 the database is not linked or merged or anything, or who we gonna call it. Uh, so I think it would be good to see it as an outside validation. So if what we find, can you reproduce it over here? Because, I mean, if we find a biomarker or, or, or something in the national history, we need to validate it anyway. And I think the best way to do that is, is in, an, uh, in, in a, another institute where you do exactly the same. Okay. And we also have a good. <laughs> so, um, well, this is the last slide. Uh, the people were very important in this. Uh, Irene, she's do, now doing the, uh, the, the, um, the natural history study together with Mark, uh, and, and these are all the people in the research, uh, and our funders, and uh, thank you. Good, I wanted to leave as much time as we could for questions, so maybe uh, Stefan and I can just stand up here and field questions. Um, but I did want to mention, as we're going through here, uh, that the importance of observational studies in natural history, I know that there are a lot of uh, patients, families, advocates in the audience, is really critical to helping us understand and helping um, as clinicians, scientists, and also as a, just a community of uh, patients and families, you know, what we're up against. We need to know, we need to know what, we're, what matters, you know, what to treat, what symptoms to target. So I uh, want to emphasize that we are currently at a stage where most of the studies we're doing are observational. This is the, uh, the beginnings of how clinical trials are done in terms of d moving from observational to interventional. And Jen uh, Farmer had that beautiful slide for her Fried Friedrich Ataxia community that showed the different phases. And um, you can see how hard it is to get uh, dr drugs or any, any interventions from phase one to anything else. Um, so uh, we just, just want to keep that very big perspective that um, we start with non-interventional trials, just, look, just sort of seeing what's happened. We, we get drugs, we try and get as many drugs as we can safely uh, to figure out which drugs are helpful and which are not, and we go from there. But on that very brief note, I want to open up to questions. So, yeah. Hi, question for Stefan. When you were looking at, or are still looking at the females, do you test adrenal function? Um, I asked Mark this yesterday. Uh, he said um, not uh, the first first time, but not not uh, in follow up. Yeah. So, so you test it first, and then you don't look at it yes. again. First so visit. Yes. So. You so you one is assuming then that there's 
the adrenal function is not going to get worse. Yeah. Uh, I understand that there is now a slight peer pressure here of me going to Mark, <laughs> telling him that uh, <laughs> to do that. It's all right. I know Mark. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> Yeah, uh, they don't. Uh, but I mean, if 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 all the other experts as well, it would be better to do that. Uh, I I will happy to try to convince him to do it. He's a nice guy, so. Yeah, I just think that it's it's the one marker whereby when you speak to a lot of um, carrier females, I'm not suggesting that they have full blown Addison's, and I yeah. think someone mentioned yesterday um, that actually a lot of perhaps the fatigue. Um, and the kind of odd symptoms that the females get could actually be down to a kind of marginal adrenal yeah. problem. So that would be great if he could yeah. add that in. And I will ask him too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No, so it should be okay. Uh, so very nice natural history and a lot of good data. Are you working with transplant physicians also? So when the, these ALD patients who go for a transplant, are those outcomes are also collected in these databases? Well, I'm saying that because uh, Utrecht has a very good paper coming out, came out on Hurler disease, where they look at the transplant outcomes in Hurler disease. And I was wondering if the same work is uh, done for ALD also. Um, it, well, it, there are only about seven patients that that have been transplanted in the Netherlands. Um, I personally uh, have met the transplant physician only once. Uh, Mark, Mark and, and the transplant physician, they, they collaborate a lot. Uh, I'm, I, I have to check. I assume that uh, that these, these boys are still in follow-up. Uh, well, they were not. Uh, the thing is that... Um, we, the, uh, earlier this year, we published a paper in, in, in the Journal of Genetic Metabolic Diseases in which we did a, uh, a follow-up on patients that were transplanted in the 90s. Uh, because uh, I've, I've had this question a lot from also from students, where, where I, give, I also give uh, lectures to students. And then one of the things that when I tell them, talk, talk to them about phenotypes and about uh, bone marrow transplantation, they occasionally ask, well, okay, so what, what now? Uh, now the, these boys that have been transplanted, do they still develop the other phenotype? And so in the beginning of this year or somewhere last year, we, we sat together with Björn van Geel, Mark Engel and me, and said, well, can we find those patients that were transplanted uh, for follow-up? And it turned out that uh, we could find five of them and some of them had signs of AMN. And I know that that there is some controversy if 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 this is uh, if this is related to to the old protocols for bone marrow transplantation, but um, I think there's reason enough to 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 uh, keep these 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 transplant transplant patients in follow up because uh, there there is a, a likely chance that our data is correct and that they eventually will develop AMN. Uh, so. Th those are uh, the long-term effects. Those are the long-term neurological um, efficacies of transplant. I'm talking. I'm more interested in short, short term, term. Uh, uh, which may which may be lost because uh, when a transplant physician does you know 50 or 60 of ALL or, or the leukemia-related transplants, they may ignore one or two of ALD or patients and may not collect all that information. True. Um, I, th I think maybe Troy, are you following up transplant the patients? Yeah, no, we follow up uh, most patients in one way or another, and that's, you know, a cohort of at least 60 active patients. The question on whether or not transplant prevents later disease is intriguing, and myself, Rob Wynn, and Paul Orchard have a study at CIBMTR pending looking at all transplant patients who are now 20 years out from transplant that have been done in the world, We've identified something about about 30 of them, um, and we're going to try to track down all 30 patients because at about 20 years out from transplant, we should be able to decide if they have AMN or not. And so this will 
Well, the, the data the data has been collected, and we're going to try to track them down in the next eighteen months. No, I just want to say, and I think Amber will agree with me, that it might seem kind of um, counterintuitive that we sponsored a trial that we all felt was going to be negative. But in the rare disease community, where a lot of therapies sort of get developed and um, whisper down the lane a little bit anecdotally, there's tremendous value in, um, in, in a rigorous fashion being able to prove or disprove a therapy. And that is money very, very well spent. And uh, we're very appreciative for that and would support that type of work going forward. Do you want to comment, Stefan, about your turnaround time on the trial? That's that's uh, you guys did a tremendous job of getting uh, patients enrolled and and getting data back to the community really quickly. Uh, share any of your secret strategies as to how you did that so efficiently. Yeah. Well, there's nothing much uh, a secret about it. I mean, if if you have the patients in the institutes, uh, they re they always asking, is there something that we can participate in? And uh, well, we had a drug that was on the market. Uh, yeah, we, we just got the drug. Uh, g well, the paperwork was the most, most obviously the most work, uh, getting all, all the approvals, IB approvals. Um, but but setting it up was was fairly easy. And uh, every month we collected blood and we waited uh, until the end of the trial. And then we we worked for two weeks very hard on doing the biochemistry. And then we s started writing the paper. So it's, it doesn't have to take too much time. Uh, and one of the big advantages, I can say that enough, is, is that, um, and I'm actually quite proud of that, is that we truly have a translational uh, research group. We are doing diagnostics, we are doing basic uh, science, we are trying to find new, new compounds, and we have the patients uh, in follow-up. So yeah, we can move very fast for, for, from the lab to, to the patients, and also the other way around, uh, get questions out of the clinic that we, bring back to the to the labs and try to, to, to find answers. Uh, I think that's the, the, the secret, which is not so secret, but. Well, I think, oh, one, one question from Jen, yeah. yeah. Um, just to come back to the point about, you know, clinical trials of supplements or off-label medications, things that you think might be negative going in and the importance of doing those studies, we've, we've done the same thing. and. Um, it has been really important because later other clinical trials are going to require people to go off of those supplements. And if you don't have data that shows that, you know, whether those supplements are actually working or not, you could be losing people to clinical trials because they don't want to go off a supplement. And if you don't have the data to show that that supplement isn't really doing anything, you don't really have much justification for asking people to go off of it. <laughs> um, so those those studies are really, really important. Um, and just, um, I think to Keith's point earlier, I wanted to echo um, a thought I had. You know, there was discussion earlier this morning about how, how do your groups come together and support one another and support the work. It's in the natural history and biomarker studies. Um, a lot of times, these aren't the sexiest experiments. Like, we have a joke in our field, you know, everybody loves to come see us and do the nine-hole peg test. How exciting. Um, but we have a 70% retention rate in our natural history study, which I think is really, really, for a non-interventional study that's 10 years out to have a 70% retention rate is really good. Um, but that's because we, as the advocacy group, have talked to the community about the importance and try to help educate everyone about why are we funding this? Why are we asking you to do this? Um, and so I think as groups, if you can come together about some key messaging on natural history studies and come up with a plan about how you can all continue to engage your patient community and the grassroots power that you have to reach people and get them into the registry, get them into portal, get them to one of the sites, that's huge. Um, and I would really, really encourage you to do that. And the social media has also helped us tremendously. When we have a new site or a new study come online, if a patient posts, hey, here I am at Cornell and I'm getting all these studies done, it's still a non-interventional study, but everybody else sees that person at that site 
participating in the study and all of a sudden the recruitment starts to go back up. You know, so these are things that you can all be doing together um, and you know, you are going to be the best recruiters for these studies and getting people into portal. Um, and so I really um, encourage you to do that. Thanks, Jen. That, that's, uh, those are great points. I, I think, um, I, and uh, to, uh, to, to go back to the point about the era we're moving into, Adeline was showing that, that very nice slide of where um, the kind of the different stages of, you know, for each of the leukodystrophies, most disorders are in, the, are in either the undiagnosed or, or not well understood categories. Some are in uh, slightly more advanced stages. But I think as a, as a community, we're going to be moving really quickly into um, more clinical trials, both observational and interventional. And I think um, I, I, I want to end on that note. And I think that there's really a tremendous amount of um, infrastructure that's being built and also um, uh, great uh, science that's being done that's going to put uh, more trials uh, in the hands of patients. And I, uh, I, I think there's a lot to look forward to. So each year, I will we'll look forward to updating uh, the community on where we are in that in that measure, and I think we should be, uh, the, I would encourage the patient community to hold us accountable and, and really push us to um, uh, be investigating more trials and putting uh, more trials into, into progress. So, we. <laughs>